food is at the heart of Alaska Native cultures. From hunting and fishing to trapping and gathering, the preparation and participation has kept communities fed and grounded in relationship to one another, plant and animal kin, and the spiritual realm. Now, under the pressures of climate change, the global pandemic, and increasing human populations, Alaska Native peoples and their food systems are challenged to shift and adapt. Alongside Black, Brown, low-income folks, and Indigenous peoples throughout the Arctic and Turtle Island, Alaska Natives are joining the growing food sovereignty movement. In 1996, La Via Campesina, a global movement of farmers, defined food sovereignty as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. This also includes their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. In the Alaskan context, this means. When I think about food sovereignty, I think about freedom of choice, like that there is a choice in my life or in a community's to like uh, acquire or have the food that is important and meaningful to them, you know, on their plate, in their freezer, in their fridge. Um, it's uh, an idea of like independence and and connection. Um, thinking about see, food sovereignty is security. It's community. It's identity. Food sovereignty to me is being able to manage your own resources on the land. Uh, we haven't been able to do that for a long time. And that's why we're in the state we're in now. Uh, long ago, the people managed the land very well and took care of their resources. I was taught about cycles of animals and fish. Most animals, uh, most everything that we eat off the land runs in cycles. We're taught not to take too much, only take what we need, and always leave some for later to keep the species going. So food sovereignty is just great stewardship of the land to me. I define food sovereignty as the ability and access to our traditional foods, to eat the, and harvest the food of your choice, not what's available or provided to you, but what you're able to actually go out and choose for yourself. And so to me, food sovereignty, especially for indigenous people, is having the right to access land at the time that you need to, to harvest traditional foods. And then also the health and wellness of the land, that you have your culture to know how to harvest, that you have decision-making power. So that food sovereignty, it's becoming harder to realize because until it's not just about like developing co-management and agreements and working in partnership. It's actually having decision-making power to say, if we don't agree with the way this resource is managed, then it won't be managed in that way. Like with having a true ability to determine, you know, how much you can harvest, when you can harvest, and when you shouldn't harvest. For my home community, uh, having access to the moose, fish, birds, ducks and geese, and uh, you know other animals that people prefer to eat, um, it it really means a a lot. Like all native communities statewide, it's uh, really defines who we are, what we are, why we are. And it's a, it's a, a life way choice. When I think about how it applies to my community, it's, it's the ability that I can go out and provide for the community. Food sovereignty is that I have abundance in those traditional foods, enough so that I can share um, with those people that make up my community and my family, that I have that ability to, to ensure their well-being and their access to those traditional foods as well.
In Alaska, the food sovereignty movement involves the continuation and reclamation of knowledge and access to traditional food sources and methods of harvesting. This, coupled with gardening and farming practices, can create localized, culturally relevant food systems. Those traditional foods make up who we are. Like, you are what you eat. And it plays a role in your wellness too. Not just eating those foods, but actually going out and harvesting those foods. That's what our people are meant to do. That's what they were born to do. And traditional foods, that to me defines indigenous food sovereignty, having access to those foods. And those foods are actually available, that the land is actually in a healthy way so that it can produce those foods. And I don't feel like there's a replacement for that. So food is, you know, can uh, be a, how if you deny it or prevent access to food and you know, it can bring a nation to its knees. Alaska is unique in the fact that we are part of, we are here on an environment that is still intact enough, an ecosystem that is still intact enough, that the land provides for us in a meaningful way, where families can go out and harvest enough from the land um, to provide for the family for the entire year. You know, it's not just a couple months, it's not just, you know, one item on the plate, it's the entire plate um, in many cases. Some of our communities throughout the state, you know, are practicing 80% subsistence. And that's kind of a rough percentage, but really it, it means that, you know, the proteins are coming from the land and the bear, you know, the, the vitamins and minerals are coming from the land. and. You know, it's being supplemented by you know, the purchases made at the WC store, you know, and at the supermarkets, you know, it's, it's not the other way around. You know, the diets aren't being supplemented by traditional foods. Um, you know, traditional foods, our original diets, are being supplemented by that, you know, Western commodity of, you know, flour or rice or corn, you know, any of those kind of um, products that you'd find that are more shelf-stable and able to be transported to our rural communities. So I think traditional foods is a huge and crucial component of food sovereignty in Alaska. To protect our traditional foods, we have to advocate for them. And so I'm always really happy to work with University of Alaska Fairbanks, the Tribal Governance Program, and Tanana Chiefs Conference, the Hunting, Fishing, Gathering Task Force. Those two entities have a partnership in which they teach people the very difficult to understand regulations and regulatory system that they have to engage in to protect their traditional foods. Something, uh, a phrase that I grew up with or a, a lesson was that if you don't use the plants, they leave, you know, and that the plants that we need in our lives present themselves, you know, and I, that's, it's about that relationship um, that we cultivate, you know, being in relation with everything around us, with the land and the plants and the animals, and it's through that relationship that we, you know, deepen our understanding and our own well-being, and that's a direct connection to our food. And so as communities you know, in my work with Intertribal Agriculture Council, you know, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of communities and with um, different tribes and with tribal producers. There's definitely an exploration of, you know, how do we continue to manage the land and maintain our access um, while also increasing the availability of these resources. And so there's a lot of exploration of you know, does that mean a community garden? Does that mean um, building a greenhouse? Does that um, mean a, a conservation plan, you know, for, you know, working to, to put a, a, con a, a comprehensive conservation plan onto the land that is under the, you know, tribal management um, or the regional um, corporation management? So, 
I think all of those actions are both protecting and revitalizing. Um, I think it it's also reflects a kind of an evolution of culture, right? You know, culture isn't a static thing. It's not you know, stuck somewhere in the past. It's, it's now, it's here, it's alive in all of us, you know, who identify as Alaska Native or really any culture, you know, as it's, it's reflected in the choices that we make. And I would say there is a strong focus across Alaska on the availability and the continued availability of our traditional foods. And also people were concerned about health, food health related issues by eating, um, you know, a lot of cheap processed foods, food that you could afford from the store, um, that, um, and the uh, dwindling moose numbers and it initiated the discussion. People said, well, we need to be secure, more secure in our food source, and we want healthy food, we want protein that could supplement the moose and the fish and the birds, um, but we also want some sovereignty and management and um, self-determination. So that was um, some of the background for the creation of the um, Stevens Village bison uh, farm outside of Delta Junction. Now, uh, the way the world is going now, the way that life is going in Alaska, and the things are getting tough again, especially with COVID now, things are getting really uh, uh, tough to get. We're starting to teach the youngins beaver trapping again. We're talking about community garden this coming summer. So we're, we know that um, creating stu good stewards of the land and teaching the youngins is going to be important in the future because that's what we're going to have to lean on. We've been bringing the kids out, teaching them beaver trapping. Uh, the school started a dog mushing program this year. We're going to have a winter camp for them to go to with the dogs to trap and uh, learn how to do things on the land and that'll continue on through the seasons. So we're really proud uh, to start doing that because it makes good stewards of the land and then brings back a, a strong sense of sovereignty in my mind. Uh, just them having them learn how to manage their own area is important for the future of their survival and the future generations. So I think when it comes to new food systems um, that we have access to a wider variety of crops. We have access to building things like biomass greenhouses or high tunnels that can extend the season so then we can grow a larger variety of crops. So I'd say there's, we are definitely thinking about using new methods to grow, but growing local produce and harvesting from the land that is our local food system and it's something that we need to make time for we need to educate ourselves on and we need to train people like we need to train our youth to become um, just local food eaters learn how to cook you know by adapting to changing environments and adopting new practices alaska native communities continue to revitalize culture through the reclamation of lifeways, building community care and reciprocity and self-sufficiency, and leading the movement to realign with healthy and thriving ecosystems. When I think about taking kids out on the land, there's so much that goes into it. Like at our fish camp, when we were teaching the kids about fish, we also were doing artwork. We were also working on language. And so like if you're thinking about language revitalization, using language around food and the land and the animals and the place names, that's what feeds our language. And so 
I think there's so many different things that can come out of revitalizing local foods and realizing food sovereignty. Especially like for me, one of the things when we were harvesting moose, we were like, what's going on with the skins? And so we started to learn moose hide tanning. And then it's a, you know, that's one of our cultural practices that we've gotten really far away from. And so not only is it the act of man, you get in shape when you're tanning a moose hide too, I'll tell you. <laughs> like, there's, there's no better workout <laughs> than tanning a moose hide. So that's that wellness, right? We're sitting on a computer and then I'm like, I'm gonna go tan a moose hide. And you're like, my muscles are computer like muscles. And now I have to like become strong and I'm looking at the grandma and she's just like going to town on the moose hide and I'm realizing, I got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> but not, so after you like tan the moose hide and then you smell freshly smoked moose hide, like it brings me all the way back to my grandma's closet and her trunk with all her patterns to sew uh, moccasins and gloves and traditional regalia. So, you know, just thinking about, I'm gonna go harvest the moose, but then you're learning to take every single part of that moose and use it and then also tan the hides. And then also you're using your language, but then you're going in and you're creating art out of it too. So there's all these different ways that connecting to the foods and you know reclaiming our rights over our indigenous foods, it plays a huge role in the rest of our cultural traditions. And same with you know beaver trapping. You go trap the beaver and then you skin it for the hide. You learn how to stretch the fur and tan that. You know, it's cold here. You need to have beaver fur to go with your moose hide. Um, so it, it, uh, they're all connected. In relation to the animals that we really rely on, there's a lot of ceremony a lot of kinship and respect for that animal that's gonna make us live. And you, you, there's a lot of traditional cultural protocol that goes into the practice of harvesting. Um, I was taught in our language, there is no word for hunting because that's like bragging, that's like, I'm gonna go hunt, I'm gonna, but rather it would be like out of respect that we're gonna go look around, you know. Food is this amazing thing that does so many things, right? It nourishes us and it supports us, it creates community. When we bite into those foods from our childhood, we might have forgotten, you know, who we were. And then you take that, you know, bite of moose stew, and it's just like, oh, right, that's who I am, and that's where I come from. It brings you back immediately to the identity of that, you know, those those memories of your childhood, which inform our identity and connect us to culture. So, so food, the access to, to traditional food and the food sovereignty means access to traditional foods in my mind as I defined it earlier and so having access means eating it and eating it means tapping into our memories and our identities and our cultures. It also means working with the food so learning as our elders have done forever how to handle a fish appropriately you know how to um, break down a, a spruce hen, you know, how to you know, harvest a moose and, and to um, honor it in the way that it demands the respect that is needed to ensure that none of the meat is spoiled and that nothing goes to waste and that um, they will continue to present themselves, you know, knowing that you have, have honored them in that way. Food is a foundation. It's it's the, the the bedrock of culture. You know, right next to language, <laughs> right? But like even when you know we're talking about 
you know, where to harvest the food and, and how to, you know, and then that gets the language kind of bubbles up, manifests out of that, that, um, that driving need, that goal of having you know, food on our plate and our bellies full. So I think food, it's just, it's a starting point and it's the ending point. It's integrated into everything we all eat. And we all can probably think of our mothers or our grandmothers, our, our favorite recipe, you know, that they would cook for us. Um, we all have a favorite food from childhood that we like to enjoy. And when we like something, we, we share it, right? We don't want to eat it just alone. We invite people to our table. And, and so it's, it's, it becomes an expression of those values of, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone has something to eat, that everyone is fed, that we're sharing, that we're showing respect for um, where our food comes from and the animals that have given their lives to ensure that, you know, we don't go hungry. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, just the, again, the act of choosing traditional foods and putting it on our plate strengthens our culture, strengthens our identity and connects us to our history and our culture.